Bridgetown Council to order on August 4th, 2020. It is seven or it's eight, eight oh seven PM AM, whatever time it is. Roll call, please, Helen. Mr. Carlton. Here. Mr. Bergeron. Here. Ms. Owens. Here. Mr. Kuhn. Here. Ms. Giello. Here. Mayor Mamula. Yes. Uh, agenda, Rick, any changes to what was sent? No changes. All right, agenda stands as approval. Oh, it is approved. Uh, we move to new business. What do you want to start with? You want to go right to the discussion items, Rick? Uh, yeah, I do. And I'll just kick off a little bit here because we want to give you an opportunity to discuss, uh, you know, the survey. Shannon is prepared to uh, give some brief summary notes if need be. Um, you know, I think you've all had an opportunity to look through it. Uh, fairly good response. I think a, a fairly well distributed response. One of the things we would like to see from the council today is to actually pick a, uh, I'll call it a closure, but it's an opening of the closure uh, when, you know, when we're going to open Main Street back up so that we can uh, communicate that. And then we want to talk a little bit about um, not only some of the data that we're getting out of the survey, the written comments, but also uh, we've completed about half of our focus groups, and we have another one that we'll be doing after this meeting uh, this morning. And, uh, you know, as we're starting to gather a little bit of information and looking ahead to the winter, and then we kind of want to get a plan with, with the council on how we might uh, approach that as we move forward and what the next step should be. So that's kind of how we would like to proceed. So, um, you know, I can let, uh, what, what do you want to hear from us? Do you want to go into a little detail in reference to the actual survey or some, yes. uh, hit some highlights of it? Yeah, that's a great idea. Let's start with that. All right, Shannon. Sure. Um, so I, I have a long list of notes and I won't run through them all because I'm sure you guys have had a chance to look at uh, the information that we sent out, but just to kind of cover a few of the high points, the survey went out on July 20th and it was available for seven days. Um, we had originally planned to, or BTO had originally planned to end it a couple days earlier, but we heard that not all the restaurants had received it or had an opportunity to take a look at it, so we extended it through that weekend. Um, and made sure that Corey had it to send out to the restaurant group. It did go out through the DMMO download and then was also sent out through all those kind of uh, organizations, retail, restaurant, and lodging. So they had a good response. They had 88 respondents. Um, I did run through the list of businesses that responded and found that seven of them had responded more than once. So for what that's worth, you just kind of take that into consideration that there was some duplication, and in one case, a triple timing of uh, responses. But generally speaking, they had good, good results and I think um, pretty conclusive results. So uh, when it came to extending walkable Maine into September, 83% of the people who responded thought that that was a good idea. Um, I'm sure you noticed as well in the comments that um, there were some folks that maybe were confused a little bit about the question and were worried that that closure might extend through into the winter. Um, but that, you know, is obviously not the case. What's being suggested is just for the month of September. So there was some folks that, you know, maybe were a bit worried about that. Um, I, I won't talk about the expected business levels. I think people gave their best guess at that. It was pretty interesting. 71% um, expected to be down, which I don't think is, is that unusual. Um, in the conversations that we've had, either through the resiliency group and through the focus groups, it seems people are cautious at best. I think they're optimistic about how things are going right now, but cautious about what the future looks like. Um, for winter, they, the restaurants are really focused on trying to keep some kind of outside seating if they have space available, and um, also focusing on takeout, 
which when we get into some of what we're thinking about for the winter, um, the idea of having places for people to pick up their takeout um, or delivery, having delivery options and things like that are going to be very important for, particularly for restaurants to keep going. Um, and retail, I think you may have saw there was one comment in there about um, having some kind of online focus, and we've actually heard that a couple times, that that may be something that can really help retail is switching their business model. Um, a little bit and having that option for online sales. In addition to that, they would like us to take a look at what signage could look like in the winter time. Um, and then as far as very specific to the town, the idea of, of us keeping and enhancing our safety protocols and making sure that those continue through the season, I think people are um, actually being really thoughtful about the benefit of having safety protocols in place and what that means for their businesses and their ability to stay open. Um, there, and I, I may get my survey and my focus group and my resiliency a little bit confused, um, but in kind of all accounts, what we're hearing is that if it's at all possible to keep restrictions in place instead of closures, Obviously, that is the, the preference, and um, on many accounts, people have said that closure could be fatal to their business. Um, again, signage was a topic and has been a topic on several fronts, and then grants and tax relief are also two items that have popped up. So that's kind of my quick and dirty summary of the survey. I have additional information if, you're, if you have any, any other questions. Um, but that's that. Okay, so should we should we put the um, discussion of the reopening of Main Street to car traffic up first, Rick? And let's just put that one to bed. So um, Dennis called me this morning to ask, just you know, sort of anecdotally with my business, what September looks like. And September is generally very strong Friday, Saturday, Sundays, um, all the way through. You know, Monday through Thursday is pretty slow, but the weekends are very, very strong. Um, I think there will be a big difference this year with kids going back to school late, some kids not going to school at all, some people doing online. I think we may have more travelers. Um, so I think running all the way till the end of September would be completely legit. The last weekend of September is uh, 26th, 27th. I would say the 28th could be the first, the 28th of September could be the first day of back to how it used to be on Main Street. Um, and I'd like to hear what the rest of you think about that. I think that totally makes sense. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Shannon. Um, just one thing I should have pointed out as a reminder, um, the October feast, which I can answer questions about, will start um, September 26th and run through October 4th, um, but it is a very, very different model than Oktoberfest, and it's basically we have 20 restaurants that have um, expressed interest in having a menu option that's a paired beer and food option within the restaurant. So just so everybody knows that's happening at the end of the month, but it, it's very different from October 5th. But there's, are they still planning on closing Main Street? No. No. Okay. No. Um, I agree, Denver, I don't, I think most of Denver is remote. So I, I think that there's an option where we could not slow down the same way in September that we have before. Um, and I think, again, it's, this is for, it's a good option for restaurants and for, you know, some retail options on, on the sidewalk, but it's also allows um, people to maintain that six feet of distance, which I think has also contributed to the success of low numbers around here. So I'm, I'm in support of it. Yeah, I am. I am as well um, for all the reasons that, uh, Aaron stated, and I'm, I'm happily, uh, I'm not, I wouldn't say surprised, but I'm happy that uh, this thing had, had good results for our businesses. Dick? Yeah, I'm, I'm in sport as well. I 
you know, I think we were thinking mid September, but I, you know, your point's good, Eric. I, you know, I think the, the, uh, folks will be around. We just hope for some decent weather. Hope we don't get a big dump and have to deal with that. So, you know, but, we will. <laughs> I, I'd be fine with that. I think we want to hesitate extending it any. I think we want to let people play and kind of pick a date today and stick with it. I agree. Dennis? Yeah, I'm in favor. I like your idea of the um, 26th, 27th weekend, unless, as Shannon said, something interferes with the BTO and what their plans are for Oktoberfest. But otherwise, that seems really well. We are absolutely going to have a snowstorm. We know that. That's going to be a pain. And I'm in favor of keeping the mask ordinance in effect. Kelly? Yeah, I agree with all of that. I don't, nothing new to share. Okay, so the 28th will be the day that the street o reopens. Well, that's a Monday. So we're clear that it may, I mean, we may actually start, we'll have to coordinate with public works. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. But, you know, we'll start, if they start moving things on the 28th, and yes. for sure on Tuesday it would be wide open. That is a super slow Monday by the way. So, you know, if the street's not open that day, that's by the time they get all the Jersey barriers out and, um, you know, BTO comes and collects all the tables and chairs. Hey, refresh my memory. Will we have, uh, uh, it, when do we do free parking? Are we going to do free parking? And would it make sense to start that a little bit earlier once we, once we open up, reopen Main Street to kind uh -huh. of, uh, uh, keep the keep the good vibe going as far as businesses. We don't do it in the fall, right, Tim? Uh, no, not, and we don't do on street free parking at any time, okay. unless you want to. But that's yes. been the direction in the past. We could do lots if you wanted to do lots. Um, I think we have done that from mid November, uh, mid October to the opening of the Scaria, but. We don't know when that's going to be. So um, if you wanted to do lots, we could certainly do that. We could work on some dates that would make sense. Yeah, I mean, I wanna, I'd like to talk about it, but I don't know how everybody else feels. I think it'd be great to get the information, Jeffrey. Let's, yeah. let's get some dates and see um, see what's a good time. Um, something that Dennis said, just, just to get everybody's head nod, is everybody okay leaving our current local ordinance in place through, I mean, for the most part, through the duration of the crisis. Mandatory mask zone, um, our normal mask policy outside of the mandatory zone. Everybody good with that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. a lot of great feedback on it. Okay. I think it's been successful. Yeah. And Honestly, I think, I was just going to say, I think it's great, like, the more consistent we can have people wearing masks, the less likely they are to forget. And even getting kids the exposure to masks, you know, over the, I mean, I know kids are wearing them a little bit at camps and things like that, but if they're going to be wearing them all day at school, the more we can be consistent showing that, like, oh, the parents are wearing it all day, too, I think the better off we all are. I totally agree with you, Kelly. I'm in agreement with Kelly. Eric, I'm 100% with you on the mask ordinance. The early closure, the 11 o'clock closure of, of bars and restaurants, I, you know, I think we, we, yeah, we play that by ear. We kind of see, see what the science is, what the dates are. It's likely to stay in place, but I think we kind of see how it goes. Well, and just for everybody's information, we are superseded by the state ordinance right now anyway. So there is no, our ordinance isn't even really in effect when you, when you think about it. So uh, I, I agree with that, Dick. We'll have to play that by ear. Um, you know, and on that topic, I'm really, really, of course, sensitive to businesses trying to make it, but I also think we need to do um, a service to everyone in the community and not um, lose sight of the fact that we're going to have a massive change in groups over the next, well, in about a month. So I just, I, I want to be really cautious about fiddling with anything else because we're going to have thousands of kids going back to school. 
So I just think like, let's not lose sight of that as a town, you know, we're obviously making small modifications and we're trying to do what's best for, um, for the, you know, the businesses and the, our community, but let's not lose sight of the bigger Summit County picture of kids going back to school and parents then being able to work. Yeah, uh, Kelly, I think that probably jumps to something that I wanted to bring up to everyone, um, sort of to piggyback on what Dick is talking about. And I, I'm sorry if this jumps over where you wanted to go, Rick, but I, I think we do need to start considering what our threshold for um, rent relief will be. And not to make a decision today, but we will need to do something else. Number one, if we do not open um, any of these businesses that are currently closed, um, we have a handful of businesses that we've done two months of, of rent for. Um, do we extend that? Number two, you know, what do we do in the event of a shutdown? What, what will our, you know, level of support be? Will we do the same kind of support that we did at the beginning of this thing? Um, if, you know, if we get into a crisis situation, I, you know, don't forget, we do everything we can possibly do does not mean that the state or the county won't do something without us or, or including us without our say. So um, if the rest of the state gets, turns into a hot zone, which <laughs> the governor did a great job and turned that tide, we were heading there, yeah. you know, if you recall uh, 10 days ago and the governor really reversed course on that, which is great. So if we get there, you know, start thinking about what, what's our, what, what are we gonna wanna do for some relief for people again, if, if anything, so. And then have we gotten any more requests? Just the four that, um, that we're doing right now. Okay. Thank Rick, you. are we gonna see the first round of the budget in September or when do we start looking at that? Are you sure? Right now the plan is to bring you the, uh, the recommended capital improvement plan, um, the second meeting in September. And then uh, we always, we present that to you by, the charter requires that that has to go 14 days in front of um, any other budget documents. So you're gonna, you're gonna see our recommendation for CIP uh, second meeting in September, and then we're gonna come to you a little earlier than we normally would with uh, the first look at the budget, the first meeting in October. So. And that's when we'll start, um, we'll probably add a little extra time than what we would normally do so that we can delve into that because we want to try to really look at the budget differently this year, I think. And, and we expect that we'll do a little deeper dive into some of the things because we need to know what's, you know, what's the basics that we got to cover in our general fund to keep operations going, what's that level of service that we're committed to for operations and wants to take to fund that. Um, you know, what's interesting and, and part of the work that we're doing right now and looking at what do we need for the winter, um, some of those things require uh, not necessarily money to businesses, but money for um, different activities, I guess, within the town. And I'll just give you one brief example. Um, you know, Jeffrey commented about how busy the trailheads have been and the trails have been and, and that you can tell that families that are visiting just want to be outside, right? And there's a lot of hikers and they're out utilizing the natural environment that we have. And, you know, some of the early conversations we're having in our focus groups are how do we replicate that in the winter? Because we may have limited skiers on the mountain through whatever system they're gonna limit that. And so how do we get people and how do we activate other areas in town um, more so than we probably have thought about in the past? And, and do we look at a different way of, of uh, you know, and I've had conversations with Scott Reed for an ask that open space, start looking at this right away and talking about what might we do differently in the winter to, to allow more access for a wider range of people and different activities. But those kind of things, you know, they require some additional funding. 
geared that way, right? If we're going to do those things. And so that's, that's some examples of how, you know, we have to balance everything that we're trying to do and prioritize it. And so the earlier we can start looking at that, uh, I think the better. And we'll do it in pieces. On something like that, it would be, you know, when you guys, when you talk to Scott, I think there's some opportunities to make some of these things like cost neutral. Like uh, if, if, if say we did like a, a daily snowshoe, social distancing snowshoe tour, just have some sort of, you know, very small contribution to pay, you know, to hopefully pay for the, for the guide or whatever. So anyway, hopefully he'll look into that. Um, and I have one other thing about uh, something else. Yeah, are we gonna be talking about what maybe the, what, what the town can do to kind of help out in this, uh, the winter season or is that uh, on another subject on a different uh, day? No, we will talk about that too. I, I not, think- Not this, not right now, but later in the morning? Yeah. Okay. You know, I just had a thought too. I, I wonder if we should reach out to BCA to see if we can do something similar to the, uh, the Biff uh, stuff in the woods. Yeah, you know, yeah. if we could have some trails in the woods, maybe back on, you know, Little Mountain behind the ice rink, where we could do some activation by the troll, where families could go and, you know, get out in the woods and see some cool stuff. Um, I, I think that'd be great. You know, we could do it as a combination of our open space and trails, um, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's somebody from the NRO playing with frozen fingers or, you know, just, just some art that, that Matt could help with us with. Um, it might, might be cool to do some stuff like that. And that's exactly the theme of what we're starting to hear, right? Because, we, you know, I think people, one of the things we're seeing and maybe a, one of the lessons learned is that I think that we've created an environment that people feel safe and comfortable here. And, uh, and maybe even more so in the winter, right? Because you're kind of bungled up and you have that natural face covering and different things on already. And um, and so that people, oh, they want to visit here, but they want things to do while they're here. The, the rec path might also be an, an untapped resource in the winter as well. Um, Absolutely. That doesn't, I, I mean, I get a little, I, like the troll area, I think that's, I think that's great. I just, you know, to, to Jeffrey's original point of, of having so many people on the trail system and you know all the locals are gonna be coming out in the winter, especially if it's if it's any kind of a challenge to get on the ski area, then people will be in the back country, side country, front country, you know. So I think I think the rec path would also be a great easy place for people to snowshoe or cross country ski. Um, so if there could be, if we could add a little attraction there, that would be another opportunity. Probably working with the county open space and the forest service, I think Baldy will probably end up exploding this winter. And we're going to have to worry about that danger too, right? Having a lot of novices in the backcountry or more novices. Trailhead. We're going to need some uh, PSAs about that, Aaron. Yeah. Um, Maybe people will get educated. Maybe people will be smart about it. I know I saw um, a CAIC workshop that's online. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's a concern too. That is a big concern. I, Rick and I were talking yesterday. I, I cannot tell you how many people have come up to me and people from out of state and said how safe they feel here and how they really don't want to go home because, you know, they're here with their kids. They feel like things are managed well here. They don't feel like the virus is the first thing in their brain all the time. And uh, I, we really need to play to that. Um, I mean, number one, to keep everybody healthy, obviously, for, for our local population. But, you know, to drive some, drive some businesses with people, you know, selling, selling what we have as the healthy alternative, um, which we, we sort of do normally, but a different spin on that, I think, is, uh, can be really successful. Well, the good news is we have a lot of smart people here that know an awful lot about the backcountry and they know yeah. a lot of different things. And, you know, I'm not, there's, you know, it's diff, different ways of grooming these things depending on the type of activity that you're trying to promote out there. And so, uh, you know, there, there's some planning and thought that needs to go into this. And one of the things I want to accomplish today is 
is kind of how we're going to proceed once we're gathering all this information and how we start, um, you know, what we want to do is we want to start pulling that into common themes that we're, that we're collecting from people and what are some, and we're already seeing some of these common themes emerging. And one of those I just shared with you is, you know, how do we create these activities for people to do in the winter? Um, and then once we prioritize and look at those, then I think we come back to you and we start talking about, you know, what are the resources that are needed? What are the, what's the cost associated with these things? But at some things we may need to pull the trigger on sooner than later because we have to start planning for it. And some things we may need to look at it in the context of the bigger budget picture. And so there's just, there'll be a lot of things that we have to, um, just kind of coordinate as we're working through these things. But in the meantime, I think it, you know, it, it behooves us to have staff that, that look at these types of activities, start thinking about it and talking to their committees and et cetera, and, and continuing to brainstorm. So if we do move in that direction, you know, we're, we're one step ahead. You know, and I, and I just want to offer a disclaimer to, you know, to any folks that are listening or even hearing about this. I think like a lot of locals, I, I get kind of um, impatient with the, with, with just the crowds on our trailhead, especially in the summer. But right now, man, I'm going to just cast that to the wind. I think this, what we're talking about now could be the difference between keeping our town afloat during the next six, eight months. And yeah, it's going to be, a, it's going to be a pain in the butt if we do snowshoe tours on some of these trails that we're used to cross country skiing on or the, the trailheads that we're used to accessing the back country. But I think we just got to bite the bullet on this one, get through this winter and, and, and then we can uh, deal with this down the road. I, I, I honestly think you guys hit on something right now. This could be what keeps us afloat. Jeffrey, this could even be something like, it, it, you know, you remember in the early days of snow sculpture when they were all over the streets? Yeah. And I see no reason why we wouldn't, you know, reach out and, you know, is that something we can, we can do again? Can we talk to, um, you know, I mean, it wouldn't be international, but, you know, to have, to have sculptures up and down Main Street like we used to have, uh, that would be really cool for people, you know, maybe on the river walk or just in private areas. Yeah. Well, I, I think we just need, I think it's good that we're starting the conversation early and we just, to your point, Jeffrey, I think we need to be strategic and make sure that, because again, I think locals will be out in full force too. And if we do have large groups all over the place, then, you know, I think part of the beauty of what Eric was saying about people and, and Rick about people feeling comfortable here where they're not feeling comfortable in other places is that we have trails that are spread out. So I think we do need to be mindful about um, yeah, it could, it could be busier, but hopefully if we're strategic about it, we can spread it out and, and that sort of thing. And I, I would love to see some, um, some partnerships with businesses, you know, Jeffrey, when you're saying, you know, it, it could be, um, cost neutral, maybe, maybe a business would like to do, you know, tours or something like that. So we're not, um, competing, but we're partnering a little bit more. And yes, it looks different than this year. Maybe we'll do things that are differently this year than we would other years because of the situation. I agree. Yeah, you know, to the just echoing the previous thoughts, I you know, I think these these um, marketing to the public type type uh, activities, you know, they're going to be in the no wake zone. They're going to be in the close in trails, and we may need to do an education campaign for the locals to say, you know, just be patient and courteous as you're going through those areas. As you get further into the backcountry, you're gonna you're gonna get your space back to yourself. Yeah, so yeah. Um, you know, and be strategic in that. I'm sure Scott is doing that already. Rick, on the budget, um, kind of back to the budget with the thought, are, are we going to do contingent planning, kind of worst case scenario if the governor was to shut down the state again? Uh, will we have, you know, a couple of options to look at or, or at least some kind of strategic direction if that were to happen so that, you know, we're not scrambling, you know, at the last minute if it does happen? Um, yeah, yes, the answer is we will. Uh, how much, uh, typically what happens, I mean, we've already go to some bare bones things uh, when it comes to 
you know, we're approaching entering 21, uh, very similar to the tier one cuts that are already in place. Um, you know, when we, if we start having, um, you know, what we go, we've already identified what, you know, for us, a second level tier two cuts. And you even remember, um, you know, you've, our new tier one will become tier two because we're going to enter the budget at a tier one level. So remember there were conversations about, well, well, let's keep one trolley going or, but you know, that'll be the first thing to go if we have to make more cuts. And there's other things um, that we know about and, and staffing becomes a big question always because, you know, we have $14 million in, in personnel costs to, to run the town. And so when you, that's, that's a big chunk of what it takes to, uh, to run the general fund in there. So, and then there's other things, you know, it's a half million dollar, you can save roughly a half million dollars by not having a, the aquatic center open at the rec center. But that's a huge attraction to this town, you know, so we got to be in a really bad place before you start making cuts like shutting down a pool for the winter. But at some point you may have to. <laughs> Well, the health the health officials might do it for us, so that yeah. yeah. But you guys, I I assumed you were thinking that way, so that's good, and we'll be able to look at that. So we, you know, we've thought. done that exercise, and we're aware of those things. Well, depending on you know, if we're talking anywhere from two million to ten million, what that looks like, and there then there's a whole list of things that we that we have ready to go. So. And, I'd shut down the trolley before the aquatic center. <laughs> I just threw it out as an example. I hope nobody on this call thinks we're closing the pool. <laughs> that's the you know, talk about something that's a great family activity that's generally safe if we can keep people socially distanced. The amount of chlorine in that, in that air, I think, kills just about anything. So, all right. So, does that, does that give us a gap of? Does that give staff a good general idea of where we want to go with this this piece here? So, but what are we? Uh, so we need, you know, we're finishing up our focus. We have a focus group today. We have a, our last focus group on Friday. Um, it's it's the participation has been a little sporadic and not, you know, I think it's a busy time of year. People. The business owners are certainly grabbing everything they can grab right now. Dick said I in on the restaurant one that we had yesterday. Um, I would have liked to seen it be a little more robust, I think. And but I, I think some people are tuning in, looking for answers, not so much bringing answers or suggestions to the table. I think they're they're looking for answers we might have as to how uh, how we approach. Um, the winter and you know there's some just i'll throw out a couple of interesting topics that are starting to surface that we really have to you know and again when you brainstorm and do these things we don't want to judge right away we just want to look at it and say is there a way you know do we when when you have a very limited when space is your is your number one asset right especially if you're looking at a restaurant and your ability to seat people and do that and and you're losing at least 50%, if not more of that, then, especially in the wind room, in the winter, that's your biggest challenge. And, and what do you do? And tents are just not that viable here in Breck in the winter. There's huge snow load issues. When you start heating them, you got to have ventilation. You got to have a lot of things, and plus the ice and all that stuff that we deal with. So, um, you know, what, what are other town facilities that are a bit unused right now or large venues that maybe could be repurposed for particular activities, Riverwalk Center, buildings in the art district, things like that are just, you know, ideas being thrown out that we, where we might want to get creative or talk about some things. And so, you know, we're hearing that come up, obviously, uh, you know, we're doing retail and we, and when you look at the written survey, we, we're getting some comments about continuing to relax our signage, outdoor signage, uh, to some extent, outdoor display of merchandise. As we approach winter, that becomes even more challenging, um, into when it's done, where it's done, 
because we know what happens when we start to get snow and ice on the uh, walkway. So that's another thing we have to look at. Um, but as we go through this and we gather this information, we're going to sit down and we want to go through the resiliency committee and discuss it. Uh, and then we have to kind of package it in some way, I think, where we come back and just have a very similar open conversation with the council. Um, so we either, we either are gonna do another special meeting, maybe that first week in September, if uh, only because um, I think it's gonna take us a couple of weeks to work through this. You're gonna have your meeting on the 25th. That'll be a fairly full meeting already because you're gonna be doing interviews for your vacant position. Um, and so I wouldn't wanna be adding a COVID discussion on in that particular day at all. And so maybe the week later, we have to do another special meeting just like this. We come together for an hour and we start talking about um, kind of what the direction maybe we're looking at getting some feedback from you as a council. What do you think about that? I think that sounds good. I mean, I'm fine. Hey, um, I, I had a thought when you guys are going through some of these uh, options for the winter time, is it, and I don't, this could be like totally impossible as far as man hours and even technical. Is there any way we could have a clearing house for town businesses it, with their links included? I, I, I you know, when, when we order out a lot and the first thing that we do when we order out a lot is kind of do a, a web search for a particular restaurant that we want to, we want to order from and, and, it, and wonder if the town could just, or, or maybe we could all get together have a mass website where any business can put their link on, you know, so, you know, uh, Biff's t-shirt could be there. So, so you want to buy a t-shirt and then kind of do that and then have that possible for restaurant takeout or even, even for uh, a delivery or mail order or something like that. Just some way that the, the visitors will have the, uh, a mechanism to find out what is available as far as takeout, or even, or even uh, mail in. Hey, hey, Jeffrey, can I get? Uh, hey, Chris, can you pull Lucy Kate into the panelists? Yeah, one Breck has all that information, but it's kind of a more internal, or it's sort of like within town facing. What's one Breck? Sorry, who do you want, Rick? It's a, BTO, it's a BTO website set up for businesses. No, I mean, yeah, but I'm, I'm talking to yeah, the public. You're saying, yeah, consumer fit focus. Yeah, like say, say you're, yeah. you're visiting, I want, I want, uh, I, I don't even know the right word now, Chinese food, is that legal to say? Yeah, it's okay, okay. So I want Chinese food, and then I, I scroll down, and there's some sort of engine, Chinese food, you know, and, and yeah. uh, so, yeah. Yeah, so I want, I'm going to let Lucy talk for a second, because, you know, one of the other, uh, themes that are starting to emerge uh, as we're talking to people, and you probably saw it, is the, the whole issue of how we do takeout. And, you know, is takeout become even more important? Takeout delivery, what does that look like in the winter? If we continue to have the large numbers, we can't service those numbers with our dine-in seating, and certain people still aren't comfortable doing that. And so this whole white glove type concierge, whatever that looks like thing is, is, has been coming up and, and uh, Lucy's wheels have been turning in her head thinking about what this could look like and how we might go forward with that. So. Good morning, Lucy. Good morning. Um, so a couple things. Uh, so on the website, uh, Kelly's absolutely right. That information does exist on uh, onebreckenridge.com and that is our more uh, local facing or business facing um, website. I suppose we could take a look at um, doing like a micro site that would have uh, business listings that would be most pertinent to, you know, take out online ordering, you know, like the, the problem with, you know, the typical business sites on a chamber website is every single business is on there and then there's so much stuff that's not relevant for what people are looking for, but we could have it be, um, you know, primarily restaurant and retail focused, activities focused. Um, so I'll talk with the team about that. Um, 
Uh, Tessa had been looking into, um, Eric, at your suggestion, uh, seeing if we could do some sort of internal reservation system for restaurants. And we looked at Moby Manage, and that's going to be really complicated and, and probably not the most user-friendly way to do it. So we're, we'll keep looking at other options, but we don't have a, a quick and easy way to do it. The, the White Glove um, concierge service is one that we're kicking around, and the idea would be along the lines of we would <coughs> potentially run it out of the Welcome Center, and we could use like existing employees, like wait staff that maybe don't have full schedules or retail folks that don't have full schedules, and they could be scheduled in at certain times and they would basically be the runners. You know, we would do our own like internal Grubhub kind of service, not charge a commission and just figure out, you know, how these folks get paid. Um, so to me, that along with maybe the microsite might be the, the two most viable um, things we could try and, and see how that goes. So we're totally open to more ideas too. That's great. Yeah. I'm more of an idea man. I'm not an implementer. <laughs> yeah. And I think another side of this with restaurants, and I mean, this isn't to say anything about retail, but just why restaurants are so, so important is our grocery store is meant and set up for our visitors to have to eat out so many nights a week. And we saw at the beginning of COVID what it looks like when people are just going to the, to the grocery store and not eating out and I we're just not set up to handle it so I think that there's a lot more relying on on visitors eating out and and buying from our restaurants because if if they are relying on our grocery stores it's it's going to be a sad state so I think I think this is fantastic and as much as you know I love the idea of the runners going up to to they're, they'll go up to the lodging properties right so that they don't have to leave their rooms. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Well, one of the things we're gonna to have to really concentrate on, uh, so the, the, the to-go thing is, I can't even tell you how massive it is. You know, on Saturday, um, we did like 500 to-go meals at night from Eric's. I mean, wow. it is, it's insane. The problem will be when we get to the winter and there's snow everywhere, how people are gonna manage driving to pick stuff up. You know, where will you park when you go to John Petro's? Will you just park in front? Where will you go when you want to get something from Whiskey Star or from, I mean, name any of it. We need to make sure that we logistically plan this out with public works ahead of time. I don't know if that means that on some blocks that don't have a back alley that's easily accessible that we just have to get rid of a couple parking spots or you know, so that there are some some guaranteed places that, you know, we can we can have some easy access parking for people to pick food up. So, I you know, and by in that same token, I think we need to once we establish that easy access, we have to figure out how to get that information to the public. Like, you know, I wouldn't I would know to where to where to park, but you know, hey, when you order from you know, uh, Mystic Pizza. Uh, this is the best place to pick up your your food, and 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 yeah. I can. They, I guess they could put it out, but we got to make that information known. They they need to. You know, the business is once the business. Say say for Mikasa. Say we say you know Mikasa can have two parking spaces in front. We'll rearrange the trip. This is just. This is not really going to happen. But say we allow two spaces in front of Mountain Wave there for Mikasa pickup. Then when somebody calls in, the bartender says, "Hey." You just park out front. There's two dedicated parking spaces for you. Okay. We'll run food out to you. So yeah. I, that'll be up to the that'll be up to the individual businesses to uh, let their people they'll let their customers know where they are. We just need to figure out where those spaces are going to be and how we can effectively help that with the snow situation. Yeah. You know, right now it's easy. I mean, people park wherever they want right now, and we've been pretty lax with it. But once there are piles of snow everywhere that will create a much different situation. And that's what we need to, I think really need to start, start thinking about talking with the public works guys about how they would like to manage some of this, um, you know, as if they're not busy enough. And we're gonna ask them to cut their budget too. <laughs> right. But that's exactly what the kind of stuff that we want. I mean, you know, we created, uh, we created 
I don't know how many lodging, uh, we have lodging stops, you know, and a, and a lodging dedicated for all the lodging shuttles around town. And um, it's certainly not that difficult of a process to create, um, you know, very strategic uh, food pickup locations that would accommodate most of the restaurant uh, areas in the core of town and have them fairly close. And, and I think, you know, the thing we're gonna look at is number one, access, safety, right? And, and instead of putting a car on Park Avenue where it's illegal to park, I would probably put one on, you know, in the, in, right up in the corner of F-Lot and we would dedicate a couple of spots in F-Lot or something like that close within walking distance. And so we have those, the challenge will be managing them, right? Because people love to abuse parking and think they can, you know, so keeping those open and available will always be a challenge, but it's doable. And it's just, but it takes, you're right. The more, those things that we do, just they require resources to do, but in the long run, they're, they're going to be for the greater good of what we're trying to accomplish. And I think it, it's going to end up being a combination of, of several things. Um, it will be cheaper for us to spend money on these things than spend money on rent relief for four months if, if we have to go the other way. So I, I think this is money well spent because every dime that you spend on a sign or on some way to mitigate the impact of this parking comes back to us in, in sales tax revenue to the town where the rent relief, you get zero back. That is just money trying to keep people alive. So, you know, I and think- It buys you a month, Eric. It buys that? you a month. It, it, it may only buy you a month. It may, who, yeah. who knows? So. But I think that messaging of safe of you can eat out safe or you can you can utilize our restaurants safely and conveniently needs to go out before people get here through the lodging properties. I think the lodging properties need to be in partnership with it too. Yeah, maybe some consistent signage or or flags or or you know those kites or something to designate the pickup areas. You know, for retail and restaurants. So. One of those <laughs> And Eric, to your point and Rick's, I think the special meetings should continue until we get a lot of these things worked out and ideas vetted. I, I know they're rough on staff, Dennis, but I agree. It's hard to it's hard to fit COVID brainstorming in on our regular just get some business done meetings. Right. Uh, you know, I agree. I'd rather go back to how we were doing it and have these a little more regularly so we can hammer suit through just some straight up ideas about the current situation. And if we have, uh, if we have stuff ready to go sooner, maybe we'll do it, you know, earlier than uh, that first week in September, because I got a feeling that September, a lot of stuff's going to start happening because that's really when we're going to, I mean, we're going to, Actually, in about two weeks, we're going to really be focused from, you won't see it so much, but internally, we're going to really be hitting the, the budget books hard and, and looking at stuff and then trying to get in and communicate early to you and, and do it in a way that's going to make sense. So um, it's kind of spinning into my head right now, but uh, so I think we have to, uh, it, it just, you know, it's funny we're talking about September and it's right around the corner already. <laughs> I think we're going to be pleasantly surprised um, with revenues from July and hopefully August also. They'll be above our projection. So we'll, we'll need to use some of that additional money that we did not think we were going to get for some of these things. Yeah. Hey, um, well, we have like a, because uh, uh, honestly, I think a, a lot of this, uh, as far as the outdoor recreation, is is going to be dependent on what what our ideas are for uh trails and open space or would we have like a separate meeting uh for this or would it kind of be brought to us when it comes to some of our other options for the uh the winter season as far uh you know everything jeffrey i think we need to turn this over to the people that we put on some of these commissions and then they come back and present options to us there's no reason that the bosac group can't be grinding through ideas change their train of thought right now and say, look, these are the trails that we feel will be adequate for some family things. Give this to the BCA, let them think about what they can do. This is how we want to change what we're doing at the Nordic Center right now. We want to add some 
whatever, you know, yeah. let's yeah. Let, let Ann and Scott think some of this stuff through and see what we can do. Um, and then in the meantime, you know, public works needs to start thinking about some of these things, you know, sort of to Rick's point with some of our facilities, can the river walk become a place where um, we can do some socially distanced tables inside when it's not being used and people can get food to go and go into the river walk. Right now it's great because people are sitting along the river, they're sitting on the lawn, they're getting food to go. That's not gonna exist pretty soon. Is there the opportunity to do that inside the river walk with 20 tables that people can go to that then, you know, we'll have staff that can clean up and sanitize and do that kind of thing. You know, um, and that would play into Lucy's uh, idea about having it, having the welcome center have, have food runners or something like that. They could, they could order or whatever. Food runners could pick it up, bring it to the river walk, which it, I mean, I'm just. And maybe bring, bring the golf course in. The golf course has parking and it's a facility. Oh, yeah. So they're in. Yeah, all, uh, all things. Everyone's got a, a specific challenge. Everyone has got something we have to, to work through and, you know, in order to make it happen. But there's no reason that these council appointed committees that you appoint to focus on these things, they can have special meetings also. They don't need to wait till, you know, the regular scheduled meetings. Everybody, the reason we started this at your direction now was so that we were ahead of the game and that we're starting to plan because as we know, winter is right around the corner. And, uh, you know, I can tell you one thing that we're probably gonna be doing differently this year with our, you know, we do all of our grants, right? We're, grant applications are coming in right now. Uh, they're awarded that in January. The, all of our in-kind grants, uh, some of that stuff is gonna be different this year because we can't start get, telling groups that we're going to give you five days for Domus Pachos at the Riverwalk Center. We don't know what that's going to look like, you know, and we may need to halt that, that particular part of the process because, um, you know, if the river, if we're closed through the first six months or eight months of, of, uh, of 21, and then all of a sudden everybody wants their in kind squeezed into the last three months of the year, that's not going to work for us either. So that, just so awareness that, you know, some of the in-kind stuff that we do, which is basic, a lot of that is facility related, rec center related, a lot of those things are gonna be, may be paused or not, um, not awarded like we would typically because we don't know what to award right now. So. I'm gonna say also, Rick, and I know this is probably, won't be popular, but there are certain organizations in this town and the, in the county that have been keeping people alive, we need to make sure we fund those organizations. There are other organizations that have different missions that are not that, and they, they might not get funded like they're, they're used to from the town. You know, food banks and, you know, relief, uh, at, at least to me, will be way more important than just about anybody else, uh, but any other organizations. And you don't wanna leave anybody hanging out to dry, but there are some organizations that are gonna have to look to their donor and say, the town's not stepping up for us this year because the town's putting money elsewhere. And that's just, I, I feel that's how we're just gonna have to look at things. Um, you know, the health and safety of the community is more important right now than you know, some of the things that we, honestly, we rely on for entertainment or activity rather than um, safety and health. Yeah. And that is a cruel line to draw. I get that, but that's, I think everybody's gonna have to start thinking that way for this winter at least. <coughs> Eric, I agree, including mental health and um, just basically social services in general. So we're going to be on a, uh, a kind of a town hall with a uh, meeting the Summit County government this afternoon or noon. Shannon and I will be uh, participating in that as uh, from Breckenridge and there'll be people from the other jurisdiction getting some updates from the county. And we'll let you know what comes from that. Um, 
I think it's more, there's starting to be discussions, right? We've slowed down, as Eric said earlier, um, not pushing for any variances right away, obviously, because, you know, let's stay where we're at right now so we can help control things. But at some point, again, are we looking at, um, you know, there's some niches out there, the beaver runs of the world, I think, that, that need to be addressed that can certainly handle a few more people in their large facility than what what's being allowed. And so some of those things as we slow, I'm going to use the word slowly move into the, the future and talk about what does that look like uh, for us. But um, yeah. And uh, so we'll, we'll see what comes from that. Other than that, there's uh, nothing on the horizon right now. I know uh, Eric and Kelly will be gone next week. So we'll have four of you. So it will be critical that all Dick and Jeffrey and Dennis and Aaron are there on the 11th. Because <laughs> um, that's a quorum. So um, Jeffrey will be in charge. The Mayor Pro Tem. Watching this, it should be pretty mm -hmm. good. It's a good meeting to watch. So yep. maybe Aaron, you better be on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> it should be one of those things, a tape delay, like a, a tape delay, like it used to be when I was on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a very, uh, it's a very light meeting. I'm estimating, you know, I'm, I've been debating on when to start it, but I'll probably actually start it at 545. Give us an hour and 15 minutes for a work session. We don't, we're not having outside presentations or anything like that. We just... We have a very light agenda because we knew and, uh, a couple of you be gone and we would have a, a smaller group. So we don't want to get into a lot of heavy discussions. We like to have the full council there when we do that. Um, so it'll be a pretty light agenda. Um, 45 to 7.15. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon, anything else related to what's going on right now or? Lucy, Lucy, I tell you, we've been working hand in hand with BTO in this whole process. And so um, it's just really, you know, it's been, a, it's been, it's always a good partnership, but it's, uh, we're relying on each other to work through this because some, you know, we're assuming some kind of non-traditional roles and what we're thinking and doing and, uh, and how we're utilizing our personnel. So. Yeah, big thanks to Lucy and her staff for everything that they've been doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Lucy. So, you know, I think just for the staff that's listening and the people that are listening, um, you know, the town council, and if any of you disagree, please chime in. The town council wants to make sure that we explore every single avenue for this coming winter, that we do it sooner than later that it, you know there are no dumb ideas right now um anything that anybody on the staff thinks hey you know what would really work because i'm on the street all the time we should do this please please let us know and any of anybody else that's listening that has a great idea go to mayor at town of breckenridge.com send us an email you know it doesn't if it if you think it's dumb, it might it might be something that we say that's a, what a great idea. So, um, th this is a community. I mean, truly community effort for this winter to keep everybody alive. You know, this will be tough with who knows what's going to go on in the ski area if they're at twenty five percent or fifty percent with reservations and you know, the, the rest of the town's at 50%. It's gonna to be tough to keep everything moving. And we need as much help as we can possibly get to, uh, to come out of the other side of this thing whole. Yeah, Eric, I was just gonna give an um, example of that. Todd Rankin, like, I don't know, six months ago, started talking about a trailhead app that he used when he was in Denver. and. You know, he talked to me about it and then he talked to another group about it. And then I think um, he brought it up at the um, reopening committee, the, you know, Main Street, Walkable Main Street committee. And now I think it's finally, I feel like this is something we really need to look into. And it's just, you know, it's sort of, 
everything's changing so fast that if there are ideas out there, if you've seen things in other communities that are working or that maybe didn't work for them, but maybe we could tweak, I think just we need help from everybody. We do not have the ideas for this. So if anybody um, can contribute, we would be so grateful. Yeah, and we're, we're brainstorming now, so there's no bad ideas. Well, there might be one or two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bringing back lawn darts that I suggest to Dick, that's not going to work. <laughs> that's very popular with our teenagers, Jeffrey. <laughs> I think that's all we have for you, the council. Uh, do you have anything else that you want to bring up? Uh, and, uh, you know, related to our uh, COVID approach, et cetera? You know, fortunately, we know more today than we did on March 14th when everything went in the toilet. So um, I think we've learned some great lessons over the spring and summer. And we are right now, I think we're better equipped to handle um, the next couple months than we were. So um, let's use that, use what we've learned going forward, gang. Good point. All right. Anything else? Thank you uh, for taking the time this morning. Thanks to, we had 90 people watching today. So thank you all for, um, for being here, taking time out of your morning to uh, look at us. <laughs> and remember, um, COVID information at www.townofbreckenridge.com. Um, information from the BTO at Go Breckenridge and One Breckenridge. And uh, to get to us, mayor at townofbreckenridge.com. And that actually goes to all the council, not just to me. And uh, most of us are available just walking the street. So don't ever feel shy about uh, coming up and giving us an idea or telling us what you think. And if it's mean, go to Jeffrey. I'm six feet away. <laughs> wear a mask. Remember, wear a mask. wear a mask, wash your hands. If you're sick, don't come into town or go to anywhere. And if you are sick, go get a test. Even though the tests are taking too long to get answers, get it anyway. So, hey, uh, before you sign off, Eric, one thing I'd like the council to start thinking about, the six of you, is what's a particular question that you would ask the, uh, the, the in, uh, applicants for the council vacancy? And obviously, don't tell me that. But think about what that is, where you feel we're going as an organization, what's important to you for who's going to be filling that seat and how, how you see that skill set benefiting uh, the council based on, on what's important to us and important to the community, what's important to you as a, as a fellow council person. So think about what that looks like. I'm guessing we'll have about 10, I, I'm not sure, 10 or 11 uh, people that we're going to interview on here, even if you do five minutes with you know a minute in between, um, you know we're gonna it's a it's a good hour, so we'll figure out how this is gonna be. Rick, uh, you know yeah. what would be helpful? Let's if we can generate some questions and push those out to the applicants, <laughs> get some written answers beforehand. Um, we can we can definitely then just use that more for a, almost a personality test when we're when we're on Zoom talking to them. We'll have some answers in front of us uh, to some set questions. Um, so we're not. If you want to do written a written exercise is a very fairly common exercise in a, in a, in a process, you know, where you're picking somebody, and uh, the sooner we could do that and get those back to you, the better. So if you if if somebody has an idea of how you would frame a couple of uh, written questions that you would like people to describe, uh, you need to get those to us all right if you have some ideas get a hold of shannon and i real quick let's try to put something together i'd love to we should get something out by the end of the week if we're going to do that I think we asked some questions this morning of, about how we're going to handle this winter and there's some we can we can yeah. get some ideas for some people you know pretty quickly i think i i think just those kind of things are going to be really important okay so everybody think about that if you can get questions to Rick and Shannon by tomorrow. Um, you know, that gives you today to think about it, either text or email. You know, this is for the council, by the way. Um, 
that would be helpful. Then what we can do is the applicants can give us some written answers. That'll give us a framework to ask some, maybe some follow-up questions, but you know, doing these live interviews are always a little difficult. That'll give us a starting point at least to ask some deeper questions uh, so we can drill down and see, um, see who we want right. to use to replace Gary. So awesome. Thanks. All, All right. right, thank you very much for your time this morning. Have an awesome day. Yeah.